Um, I want to let you know that I just bought a pack of Mills Duds outside. I was at the movies, and I had, couldn't resist. I mean, this is just something you do when you're at the movie theaters, right? So, Well, I'm going to talk about reactive programming. And while my mouth clears, we're going to talk. And I want to let you know, um, my name's Andrew, and um, I am a programmer at Carbon 5. And what Carbon 5 does is, whoa, that jumped a lot of slides. <laughs> Carbon 5 is a development agency. We're based in Santa Monica, so it took me about two days to get here. I camped out at the Motel 6, and I made it here just in time. And uh, we do a lot of extreme programming. If you love pair programming, if you love TDD, if you love making great products, Talk to me. I've been an object-oriented programmer for a very long time. The paradigms have served me very well there. So a lot of the, the things we take for granted as the, the, the true things you must do to make good objects, they served us very well. Solid objects, the law of Demeter, um, test-driven development. A lot of those paradigms came out of objects and how to deal with them, how to deal with state. But this functional world was really calling to me. I mean, after a while, you feel like you kind of want to learn the next thing. And a lot of my colleagues who kind of crossed the line, who went off into like Rivendell and came back and told me about functional programming, they told me a lot of cool things were happening there. They were telling me about, oh, the beauty of declarative programming over imperative uh, functions that are pure and don't have side effects. Um, the beauty of seeing data flow um, just explicitly called out in your programs and not having to deal with or manage state, taking out a certain class of bugs. And I said, ah, that's kind of nice, but I mean, my world works for me. I'm not really sure about your functional thing because when I read your code, none of it makes sense to me and I don't know how to maintain it. But uh, sure, you can do it your way and I'll do it mine. So I was kind of a couch potato. I kind of stood on the sidelines and kind of watched people go about it. On the other hand, I'm, the other part of my life is I'm a runner. And I've been running for a very long time, probably most of my life. And I love it. I enjoy it. It gives me, gives me life. I really enjoy it. But I've been injured for my entire running life. Um, how many of you guys are runners or do any sort of endurance events? You will probably also be injured at some point in your life, um, probably all the time. And I read, I was doing a lot of reading on how do I stop getting hurt? Um, well, a lot of articles are telling me about, oh, you need to have a strong core. You need to basically do a lot of push-ups and sit-ups. And then they're talking about running form, and then people were saying barefoot shoes. One of the things that came out was, hey, you should develop a quicker stride rate. You should move faster. You should run lighter. So what that meant was we, some runners were telling me about how they would run with a metronome app on their phone. So this thing would just click off a certain tempo, and you would run with the metronome. Other programs were like little watch apps that would, that would show up on your GPS watch and tell you if you're running too fast or too slow. And around the same time, I got a Pebble watch. Um, it was cheap. And, um, and I learned that it had an accelerometer in it. And I realized I could write an app for it. And I figured, well, why not just make an accelerometer-based pedometer or like a cadence counter for my Pebble? How hard could it be? Um, it's actually not too easy. And <laughs> What I decided to do is I wanted to say, this is the time in which I'm going to go dive into reactive programming. What I wanted to do was use this as my excuse to work with asynchronous data streams. I've heard it said that, that um, reactive programming is especially, particularly good with asynchronous data streams. And what is more asynchronous than real life? What is more streamy? than my motion uh, as I do a workout along the street or around my neighborhood. So, couch potatoes, together tonight, 
We're going to do it. We're going to learn. And I hope you'll join me. Today, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground, and I will probably fail. So all those things you see up there, I may have to start going a little higher level when I start running out of time, but we can talk afterwards. Tonight, we're going to, talk with a, we're going to start with an introduction to what functional reactive programming is. We're going to talk about a tool set called, uh, called RxJS. We're going to try to build a pedometer with it, and I'll show you how I then used another framework called CycleJS to make a small app for it. And then we're going to try to toss it on a Pebble watch. And if it doesn't work, don't blame me. So let's go back to, our, to the statement we're going to hold on to tonight. Reactive programming is programming with asynchronous data streams. I don't know what that means. But what are streams? Streams are like pipes. Not quite those pipes, but they're kind of like these pipes, or maybe these little faucets or something. A garden hose, maybe. Here's my first pass, my first attempt at trying to describe a stream. Maybe it's like an array. Maybe it's like an array of numbers. Let's say this is an Apple stock price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And it's, it keeps changing because real life keeps changing, right? So five seconds later, it's jumping. 10 seconds later, holy cow. And maybe this array, you get the ability to listen in on it whenever things change. Well, let's try another way. Another way is that, let's think about these as you're holding a pipe. Like you're, you're literally holding a garden hose. And you're watching little golf balls spit out of your garden hose. That's the best thing I can come up with. But let's say you're holding a hose and like little Nerf balls are popping out of it. You can't peek into the hose to look into the future. And you can't, you can't count all the golf balls or the Nerf balls that are out in the past. You can really only look at or count or inspect the golf ball or the Nerf ball that's coming out of the pipe at that point in time. So in that extremely accelerated animation, what this would look like would be at one point in time, you get the value one, and as time passes, you get a new value, more time passes, more time passes, and so on and so forth. You might think this is familiar because it's everywhere in computing. Unix pipes allow you to take the output of one, stream it to the input of another. Web sockets have uh, conceptually integrate this. At a higher level, you might subscribe to an external API that might real-time push data to you, like the Twitter streaming API. Anything in Node that's backed by the streams library, which is backed by event emitter. Gulp and Express have these concepts built into their very architectures. I'm going to skip talking about node streams because we don't have time. But if you want to talk about it afterwards, we can do it. So we're going to do a quick aside. A stream is also known as an observable. And that calls back to the, that calls back to the definition of being able to observe any changes, anything coming out of the pipe or the stream at any point in time. So be on the lookout for observables. These things are codified in RxJS. Bacon.js, a lot of these functional reactive programming libraries, and also perhaps in ES7. So I'm going to take us all the way back to your high school or your college math class. And in that class, you learned about functions. And you learned that a function took an input and it spit out an output after doing a transformation on it. So for example, in here, the input is a 1 and out comes a 5. Let's switch the function again. The input goes in as 1, and if it's less than 10, it spits out false. So we're going to have a lot of boxes and arrows. Hang with me here. Let's think about functions in terms of how they relate to streams, because we're going to start looking at values changing over time. And I'm going to use the pedometer as an example here. So here is a recording of me running and the three axes, uh, the three colors, there's actually four on this graph, but the three colors here are the three axes that come out of the accelerometer. It's an X, a Y, and a Z acceleration. So that very first line up there, events from accelerometer, oh, actually, okay. So that very first line up there is 
essentially um, a stream of events that are being reported back from either my Pebble, from the iPhone accelerometer, or perhaps from the HTML5 device motion API from your cell phone. Let's imagine that along that, um, the, the motion stream is emitting these events at different points in time. We don't know what time they are, but they just happen at some point in time. Now, there's a map that happens on top of that stream, which basically applies this method on the event that comes out from this stream. So basically what's happening is, this guy is just plucking the value y off of uh, the incoming event. And so basically it says, hey, I'm just gonna take, a, I'm gonna take the y and I'm gonna make that me. So out of these two streams, normal data, that second stream is gonna dump out a one with the input of this. Um, whoa. So what, what we're seeing here is the normalized values of, um, from the accelerometer out into, um, out into normal like integers. And the reason why I wanted to do this was because I needed a clean way to start doing some math on it. And I didn't want to have to deal with uh, multiple dimensions. There's a, there's a lot of different uh, normalization functions too. I didn't have to choose to use just the y-axis. I could have taken the square root of the sum of the squares. That's one common way to kind of normalize motion data. But that's a, that's a discussion for another time. I wanted to point you to this resource before we continue. If you're ever curious, I would look up RX Marbles. RX Marbles is a great resource. It basically allows you to play with these values and to observe how things work. So you might be able to see that what merge does here is it kind of takes in the inputs of both of these and puts them all onto one stream. So here we're gonna take a look at a bunch of functional tools. We're not gonna go through all of these. In fact, we're probably only gonna go through two or three of these in our examples. But I wanted to show you that a lot of these functions are functions you may be familiar with before. For example, some of these are ES5 operators. Some of these you may see on low dash or underscore methods or in a framework of your choice. A lot of these are common functional program paradigms, but in the reactive world, there are a few new ones that deal explicitly with time. For example, this one right here, debounce, that one basically filters out, filters out duplicate incoming events on a certain time frame. So if you click too fast or something like that, it'll, it'll basically prevent it from firing too many times. And um, there's a few more here, scan. Um, we'll see a few more in our examples. I drew out a whole bunch of uh, ASCII art for this, so you better appreciate it. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is a ASCII representation of that big graph I showed you. And basically what I, here's, here's my hypothesis when I went, when I went in. I said that whenever, the, whenever I see a peak in a trough in the, um, the y-axis, I'm gonna call that a step. So I'm gonna assume this is a step and this is a step. Now it's not exactly a step, and we can talk later about why it might not be, but for the sake of this example, let's just say that this is a step. The question is, how do I convert these values into this thing? This thing, like in the end, what I wanna do is I wanna spit out a thing that says, step, step. <laughs> you know, like all I wanna do is do the math to get one single step event. So how do I get there? Well, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to calculate the rate of change of acceleration. So what we're seeing here is the delta between one value and another value. I made up these numbers, this isn't exact, but you can see that the rate of change is decreasing, and as soon as it gets over here, the rate of change is negative, and then it increases again here. I, I then kind of simplified this and said, um, anything that's positive is gonna just become a plus. I just called it a plus, there's no reason it had to be that, it could have been a true value or anything like that, but intermediate in here. Um, I then said that this stream now is gonna be defined that any time this value change, plus, 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 minus, that's this point right here, plus, 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 minus, I'm gonna call that a step. So how did we write this code? By the way, if you wanted to know, the, the rate of change 
the derivative of acceleration is called a jerk. I thought that was funny. So this method right here, we're going to use a bunch of our magical wizard RxJS FRP operators to do what we wanted to do out here. So what we're going to first we're going to do is we're going to group these up pairwise. What that what that means is you get you get the new value plus the value you had in the plus the value you had in the past. So that lets you compare two values at a time. And basically what I want to say is I want to calculate the difference in the um, over here I call it a power value, but it's basically the normalized data that I got in from the accelerometer. And then I also threw in a timestamp because I still need that to carry through my stream. Over here, we're converting our, our, the differences. So from here, we're going from here to here now. And over here in that plus, we're just basically mapping. If you're positive, you're a plus. If you're not a positive, you're a minus. And then over here, it says basically um, ignore. Don't fire any new events. Don't let a new event through if it's a plus until it changes. So that means every time this guy fires, and then another one of these guys fire again, that second one will be silenced. Nothing, 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 and then it changes. It changes, and then it fires. And finally, there's a debounce, because sometimes these things like jitter up and down, and I just wanted to get rid of that noise. Moving faster. We're going to take, so what we've basically done is we've done this and this. I'm going to leave that as an exercise up to the viewer. And what we can do is we can kind of chain these guys together. We can basically say this guy passes data to this guy, passes data to this guy, and this whole sum becomes just our pedometer. Okay, so in, in go these raw accelerator, accelerometer values, and out come these nice, maybe accurate, maybe not, um, <laughs> cadence, cadence rate calculations. And these, remember, are changing over time, so this can go in at a certain rate, and these come out at maybe a different rate. We basically made one long transformation. Okay, so apps in reality are a lot more complicated than just like a transformation of values on a screen. You need to do things like you need to manage state in an app, you need to talk to the outside world, you have a big code base, you gotta, you gotta make it composable and modular, and um, it's gotta make sense. Well, let's see if we can do that just with streams. So, a lot of FRP apps will follow this common pattern. It's oftentimes called a reducer pattern, but it follows these three steps. First one is transforming inputs with map, then state gets recomputed with scan, and outputs are updated with map and or filter. So once again, here's my ASCII drawings. In go our maps, state is computed and stored here in the scan, and then all the updates to the states move out to the outputs. So what that might look like is input things are things like DOM events, like a button gets clicked. Um, it could be a domain event from a different, different uh, module. Or it could be an HTTP response from an external server. And then out could be the, 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 the opposite. I'm going to go have React update the DOM. Something else happens. Somebody else, or I have to go fire some event on some message bus. Or I'm going to make a HTTP request. In our limited time together, I'm going to fly through the next slides. So we're going to start by mapping the inputs. So all these accelerometer data events are going to come from the device motion API. And basically, we're going to map them into this input stream of raw data. So that's number one. Oh, yeah, we should also connect our pedometer. So basically, we plug this guy into this guy and out come these values. You'll note that I'm starting to use this format for, a, for an event, and I'm calling it, well, it's, it's what I'm gonna call an action, but if you're familiar in Redux, this is gonna be a, a similar pattern in a similar format that you also follow in Redux. We're gonna also have a start button that basically allows you to start the, uh, to start the app and to allow you to start listening into events. So we're going to merge these together into stream. So imagine the user clicks start, and then the accelerometer starts emitting an event. So this comes first, that comes next. Observable.merge simply just 
blindly merges whatever comes through these streams. Here's the interesting part, and the part I always like to do, is the scan. The scan basically allows you to update a single source of truth about the state of your application. So what's the minimum amount of state that your app needs to store? It's anything that your UI depends on, and it's anything that stores the value that you might need in the future to recompute. So in our case, it's really simple. Really, it's just gonna be the actual running state of the app. It, are, are you stopped or are you started? And then how fast are you running right now? Well, you're at zero because you started the app. All right, so over here, this, if you've ever done reducers and redux, this is almost exactly the same thing. There are different ways to do this as well, but for the sake of my implementation, I basically follow the redux model. Basically, any actions that come through will modify the initial state. Remember, this initial state comes up here. So anything that comes through is gonna go modify the object that assigned basically creates a new object bringing in the properties from the old state, which is basically the initial state, and then it's updating the value, the run state value, on the state. And what we'll see at the bottom is, the when the app starts up, the current state is zero and it's stopped, but then as soon as I get a start event, it, start, it updates the run state property on, on the state, and then it changes it to started. And then once a cadence event comes through, then this also updates the cadence value on our state. Finally, we're gonna go update the output, and basically, when you call dot subscribe, you basically listen in to a stream, to an, uh, to an observable, and you can basically tell it to modify the world. Over here, I'm using jQuery. You could replace this with React DOM, you can replace this with anything of your choice that talks to the outside world. In fact, you can do other things like making another HTTP request. You can push it down to a WebSocket. You can do anything else you want. You could log to the console. And then there's something about cold streams and hot streams in RxJS, which we will not talk about here. But basically what I'm telling you is don't forget your subscribes if you're going to be playing with RxJS just starting out. All right, so we're gonna see it in action. You can open this on your phone if you want. Um, but basically, if you load it up, just shake, shake your phone and just start getting some sort of reading that comes out. It's gonna be a page that kinda looks like this. And basically, you can choose either a recorded stream, which is me running sometime last year, or you can click this and that'll be your live, that'll be your phone's data. And you hit start and this guy should start working. We're not gonna to talk too much about Cycle, but I wanted to talk about one very cool thought that Cycle gives you. Cycle's key insight, oh, well, first of all, what is Cycle? Cycle is a way to structure an application using only streams. Structure is built with RxJS under the hood, and it provides ways for your app to talk to the outside world, store state, and move things around. So, the key insight in, in Cycle is that the human and the computer are actually feedback loops, or they're one feedback loop. This is pretty obvious, right? You look at it and you're like, duh, I knew that. So it's something that they call, and I think in Haskell, they also call it a dialogue abstraction. The computer is a function. It takes inputs from the keyboard, the mouse, the touch screen, and then it spits out data back to you through the screen. It might vibrate the phone. It might play a, play a sound through the speakers, and then this is a little controversial, but the human is a function. We take inputs from our eyes and our hands and our ears. We make some decision about it. it might not be rational, but outcomes, outcomes and output through our fingers back to the computer. Interesting, huh? Because inputs and outputs, that's kind of familiar. I mean, we were just talking about functions, right? So in the cycle world, cycle deals with this half of the equation. Cycle, if we were to build a application for a pedometer, you might think of the application in this way. The human moves, meaning you and I move or we shake our phones, and the accelerometer events go into, into the machine, and how come you know, cadence events that get updated into the DOM, the human looks at the screen and says, oh shoot, I should run faster slash slower slash I need a water break. So, 
in, in Cycle, these are the actual things that go on. And so we have the DOM driver. Um, so there are things called drivers, which are basically ports into the world. So the DOM driver handles, uh, it handles outputs from your app and renders them into a virtual DOM and then it provides an adapter to actually render a DOM into uh, a DOM element into your browser or into your server app. And then it also provides an input back into the main app to, uh, to send events into should the user play with the DOM. There's also something that I threw in there called the motion driver, which basically um, acts as an imp uh, as a input device from your accelerometer. I'm gonna skip a slide, but if you wanna talk cycle, we can talk. Um, and here are some links to some places you can do use to get started reading. But I wanted to show you really quickly, everything you see here, everything up to here, starts to look like an RxJS operator, because it really just is. So check it out, this is input being transformed to an output rendering back into the DOM. All right, so the Pebble is actually nothing that interesting. <laughs> uh, I started writing my Pebble app and then I realized there's so many more interesting things in this. Basically, uh, there's a thing called Cloud Pebble and you can load things, uh, you have to upload your own files, but you can basically bring in things like, like RxJS or my own uh, JavaScript module. And then you can basically make your app here. You can basically compile it and it pops up on your phone. It's, it's pretty amazing. Props to the Pebble team for making a JavaScript API. All right, so in conclusion, everything is a stream. You just have to kind of tilt your head a little bit. Slowly build up your familiarity with RxJS operators or FRP operators. This pays off a lot. This has actually changed the way that I think about some of my OO code. Um, it helps me think about how, how things are composed, compiled, brought together, split up, split apart. But there is a learning curve. Start slowly. Don't feel bad if you got frustrated because I spent a lot of time being frustrated. There's a lot of things about the reducer pattern that are really powerful and keep an eye out for it in future frameworks. And this is an interesting insight that I want to bring up is your app is a dialogue between you and the system. All right, further reading, check it out. That's it, thank you very much. <laughs>